Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jane Schodel. I'm the programmer for the special presentation section of the festival, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the world premiere screening of Blueback, written and directed by Robert Connolly. I would like to thank our lead and major sponsors, Bell, RBC, Bulgari, and Visa for their continued support. Thank you to our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto for their continued support. This film is eligible for the People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite films at tiff.net backslash vote. We would like to thank Hanway Films for providing us with this film. Thank you very much. And thank you to Screen Australia for their generous support. And welcome to our friends from the World Wildlife Fund here with us today. Shout out to World Wildlife. Blueback is the fifth film from renowned Australian filmmaker Robert Connolly that we've had the pleasure of presenting at TIFF. Please applaud for that. We're super proud. His previous films here include The Bank, Balibo, Underground, The Julian Assange Story, and Paper Planes. In 2020, his mystery thriller, The Dry, was a massive commercial success in his native Australia. And in tonight's gorgeously photographed film, Robert Connolly returns to the festival with a story about a young woman's connection to the ocean and her inherited mission of environmental advocacy. We're delighted that we have an opportunity to have a conversation with our guests after the screening, but please beforehand, join me in welcoming back to Toronto, Robert Connolly. Um, thanks, um, Jane. And it's incredible to be back in Toronto, and Jane has championed, as has the festival, my career for so long. It's a strange journey as a filmmaker across your career, um, and having film festivals, it's like a home, returning to Toronto with my films and meeting other filmmakers, but also meeting the local audiences who've been, over the years, so generous in coming to films uh, that we've made. Uh, and today, we're gonna take you with this latest film to some of the most beautiful parts of Australia, some of the most remote parts, to the Ningaloo Reef, which is on the west coast, and to Bremer Bay in the southwest of Western Australia. Um, these were incredible parts of the world to film in, and the film takes you in both places also beneath the surface of the ocean. Incredibly challenging as that was, uh, the film for all of us became a very passionate call to arms about saving the ocean. I think um, the team that we brought together, um, the investors, many of whom are here, our cast, our crew, felt that there was an opportunity for us to take audiences like you to somewhere so special to us in a hope that we could do what Jacques Cousteau once said, and, and it was an inspiring quote early in my career, if you can make people love something, they will care for it. And I think we all hope that we can continue that legacy with this film. But one of the things I've done in all of the films I've made is bring some of the actors here. So I'd like to bring to the stage, in her first feature, um, it, she's in her final year of school. I understand she had to miss an exam to be here, which is great. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding, we auditioned over 1,000 people for this role. Um, and you were seeing someone in her very first role at the beginning of her career, Ilsa Fogg. And um, playing Ilse's mother in the film, an actress well known to many of you. Her films have played at TIFF over many years. A friend and an extraordinary Australian act actress, Rada Mitchell. <laughs> we've, got, we've got some friends in the audience. We've got the team at Screen Australia that helped us. I'm really excited. We've also got some of the people from the Flourishing Oceans Initiative who are doing such great work saving the ocean. Uh, we've got Bruce Manning here, actually, who helped find the area where we filmed in the Great Southern Region, and the Hanway team who are taking the film to the world. Um, we'd love you to join us after the screening. I'm going to invite the producers that helped me make the film uh, to come up as well as Ilsa and Rada and to have a conversation with Jane. Uh, so we'll see you after the film. 
Thank you, everyone. Um, we're very pleased that we have an opportunity to have a few moments of conversation with our guests. So if you have a question, if you could please put your hand up and wave it against the light. I'm going to step out of the light to make sure that I get a chance to see you. Um, if you can keep your questions as brief as possible, that would be great. We can, s we can squeeze more in. Uh, and I think those are the rules. I will repeat them for the benefit of everyone else in the house. So please join me now in welcoming back and congratulating Director Robert Connolly. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. Give you your big applause. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I'll bring um, a few new faces to the stage. Uh, you can imagine it was a, the most complicated production I've ever worked on, pulling off everything. My producing team, Liz Carney and James Grandison, who helped me. And I've got other members of my team, Robert Patterson and Tara Bilston in the audience too. It was a massive effort. And um, again, in her very first film, Ilsa Fogg. And she was having a little tear next to me in the cinema. Rada hadn't seen the film yet. Rada Mitchell. All right. Are there questions? This one at the back there on the aisle, please. The question is, how did you do the blue bat grouper effect? Um, so, I've, I've got a great love of puppetry in cinema. I think it goes back to films like, I guess, E.T. and uh, Yoda and even Jaws, I guess. And so, we had big discussions about whether to create Blueback with VFX or practical effects. And we worked with an amazing sculptor uh, who created uh, a puppet for us. He, he created Blueback. And uh, it, it Blueback is a... Um, controlled by four puppeteers above the water on a gantry and who control his, his fins and his mouth and his gills. And uh, I, th I guess the question for me as a director was, we, we watch films now that are, uh, you know, you can watch a live action film that's actually 80% VFX. And uh, we decided to go with a good old fashioned um, puppet. Um, it was a massive risk and we were terrified, like if, if um, if Blueback didn't work. But when I worked with this amazing sculptor and he, we studied blue gropers, we swam with them, we learned about them, and I could see the magic in the way he was sculpting, um, sculpting Blueback, I thought, I thought we'd have a chance. And I guess the actors had the experience of swimming with, um, with a puppet rather than a, a VFX. <laughs> and how was that? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah. 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 We were grateful for that because we didn't have to imagine. I mean, I've done other films where there's like a piece of tape on a stick, and you know, <laughs> got to have an emotional experience. But in this case, uh, there was three puppeteers, and they were all synchronized, so it, it really looked real in the in the pool at that point, and so it was kind of easy to engage. Incredible. There was another question here. I thought yes, right there. So I'll do the last thing first. I was sitting first. behind you. Um, so she said, that was amazing. I laughed. I cried. Um, but overall, how much CGI is that? I mean, when I see the whales. Not much. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that's not. No, I mean, it was, Blueback was a real tactile, touchable puppet. <laughs> um, I mean, there were elements to blend him and the, the cast in with the water and the, we did background plates. I don't want to give too much away, ruin the magic. <laughs> But, um, I mean, James can speak to the fact we did many underwater shoots to get the beautiful underwater elements. Yeah, we, we shot underwater a lot and then a lot of the CGs, the composition of everything to make it all seamless, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. So, right. actually, the marine life that you see is real footage. We filmed on an Ingaloo reef, the whale sharks and those sequences, and down in Bremer bay in, which is an incredible part of the world if you ever get to go there and marine biologists from all over the world travel there because of the orcas that are a couple of hours off the shore um, but all of that footage is real real um, c 
creatures. So really it was just compositing the puppet into the world was really the only VFX element. That's incredible. Uh, any other questions? Oh, right there, please. <laughs> Western Australia. Western Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I could repeat, I'm not going to repeat um, about your childhood because it's lovely. I can't do that, yes. Um, but the question is, how aware or active were you possibly in environmental causes beforehand? And has doing this film changed your activism or outlook? Well, I hope that the action of making the film um, is an action. And that was one of the things that attracted me to the script, aside from just the emotional resonance that, that you're talking about. And for me, making the film we were shooting during COVID and I was returning home and seeing my parents age and so it was all of that um and honestly I just have to say this is the first time I've seen the film and I was like dying, crying <laughs> <laughs> like, so beautiful thank you um so yeah I mean personally I think some of the actions I take I'm mostly vegetarian you know just actions in life um politically I'm always look I, w I was looking for a way to engage and this seemed like it an amazing opportunity to sort of speak without preaching um, and not just to the story, you know, about, you know, the imminent apocalypse, but just this sense of, of um, collective community with all these sentient beings on the planet. I think the movie really speaks about relationship more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've always acknowledged the impact we have on the ocean, but I think doing this film really made me aware of it. And I'm not just saying this, but now, even more than I ever used to, every time I say a piece of rubbish, I'm not just saying this either, like, I will pick it up. <laughs> like, I'll walk past it and I'll see it, I'll keep walking, and then I, this thing comes in me and I just start walking back and I pick it up and I put it in the bin. And I, I, don't, I don't know, I just think, because I live half an hour away from the beach back in Australia, and I go to the beach all the time, I love the beach, but I just look at it, I used to just look at it as a surface. And I think doing this film, it really gave me the opportunity to see what was beyond that surface and like the ocean and how incredibly beautiful it is. And that it's kind of scary in a way, but I think it's so important to preserve it because it's amazing and really beautiful, yeah. And, and both, um, we had no stunt doubles, so all the underwater work was done by the actors. And Ilsa, um, amazing. yeah. Amazing. I think Ilsa probably wouldn't boast because she's quite humble, but she learned how to free dive 20 metres down, 50 metres along the bottom. There were moments I couldn't believe as a director with Ilsa coming off the boat and diving down and swimming to the depths. And, and Rada as well had to learn to steer a boat as well. <laughs> and Excellent for, boat work. Um, but it was one of the decisions we made, I guess it's similar to having the puppet, was that the actors would do everything. And, I, and taking actors who, I remember Rada had a chat with me when, and I offered her the role, she said, you know, I'm not that comfortable in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and, by, and by the end of the film, um, you know, Rada was, was also free diving and, and doing those incredible scenes under the water. But I guess part of the adventure for all of us was, it wasn't that we came to it already yeah. kind of as, as much an activist kind of team as we became and also in terms of these guys kind of becoming you know more connected to the ocean probably through making the film beautiful um i'll come back yes go ahead Uh, 
Um, the question is first, congratulations on a wonderful film. And the question is about what really is the most difficult part about shooting under the water? There's lots of difficult parts. <laughs> I'll give you one little story. The, the ten-year-old Ariel, who plays the younger little girl, the most terrified I was as a director was the day that she dives down to get the, the ring from the bottom. When you've got shark mitigation drones going around to make <laughs> sure there are no sharks, and you're about to ask a ten-year-old to swim to the bottom, <laughs> um, yeah. it was pretty. It was pretty crazy. Um, I don't know. I think Boats, we all probably water. have. A, Seasickness, and I never got on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was really cold, I'll say that. There were days when it was freezing, but I don't know, I was kind of feel when you get out of the water, I kind of felt cleansed in a way. It was quite nice, like taking an ice bath. It's better after than during, but I don't know, it was a great experience. I'm sort of remembering the shoot now. We were on boats most of the shoot, so that's a whole kind of exercise in itself when you're all day kind of keeping balance. Um, so physically, you kind of felt the day by the end of the day, but as Elsie said, it, there was a kind of exhilaration to it of being in the ocean almost every day. Th these actors, I tell you, there was one day, getting through the day was really hard, and I'll tell you why. There was one day, Rada's steering the boat, and we're filming her, and we're talking to her on the walkie-talkie, and, and a pod of whales, came, uh, of dolphins oh, came through, and the dolphins were everywhere, and Rada just took off to follow them. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, on, we're all on the camera boat going, Rada, come back. Come back. <laughs> We've got to catch I this don't know. right now. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? Yes, exactly. But no, there were challenges, but I think those challenges are why we don't see many films mm. beneath yeah. the water. And I had incredible support from an amazing team who worked out practically how to do it. And every day was incredibly challenging, but, it, but fun too, like one of the great adventures of our career. Uh, there was a question here. Yes. Um, her question is, um, from a story standpoint, why would you have both the father and Maka die in the ocean in a story that's about um, conservation? Yeah, it's a really good question and something we talked a lot about um, because it's the balance of life and death in a story like this and, and trying to get the rhythms of that right, uh, particularly with Dora uh, dying as well and the fact that she lost her father. Um, it's based on a, a novella that, I f that was published by Twen Tim Winton, one of our great authors in Australia about 20 years ago, and, and he kind of tried to capture a sense of a life lived so that the, the film could, could if we, in trying to capture the book, it was a real challenge to, to kind of show the shape of an entire life and the, the, and the ebb and flow of life and death within that. And so I, I felt that... Um, I, f I felt kind of in some ways beholden to what he had achieved on the page. And, and that's why having the three actors was another incredible challenge and the thread of entwining it. And, but he's very big on the idea that there's a kind of natural cycle of things. Like I, I hope that, you know, the sadness and tragic loss of her father has actually informed her and bonded this mother and, and daughter. And that Maka kind of echoes that. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really interesting question, and I think it is one of the, the elements of the film that we talked a lot about, trying to get the balance of, and... Thank you. Are, are there, yes, right there. Oh, I'll come back. Um, <laughs> Her que sorry, her question is, um, she felt like the home was another character in the film. It was so stunningly beautiful. Does that actually exist somewhere? Uh, well, it exists. It just doesn't exist as a home anymore. Um, we, we built that entire thing uh, on an amazing plot of land that our production designer, Clayton Jauncey, uh, picked out and found. So the entire home is a set. So we built it from flatland to what you saw on screen. 
So it's complete construction. So, yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> renting it out. Is it on Airbnb? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, unfortunately, it wouldn't, wouldn't last in the rain, I'd say, that one. <laughs> Good to know. We have time for one more question. Right there, please. Um, if I can grab that question, I think her question is, um, Abby, as an adult, when she, um, she says your world is dying around the dying coral reef, yeah. um, is that a part of the larger issue? Um, I'm sorry, I missed the second. Yeah. But That's I don't right. know what That's to right. do about it. Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, the, the idea, and, and talking to a lot of people in the environmental movement, we've got marine biologists here and other um, people doing great work in the environment here, there's been a real shift to this idea that if we, um, of optimism, optimism steer, you know, stimulates activism. And if, so if you tell someone the Great Barrier Reef's dying because of climate change and there's nothing we can do, people despair and they do nothing. But if you show them the great work that marine biologists are doing, uh, it inspires you and makes you go, okay, maybe we, we can help. So for us, uh, philosophically, we felt it was a story about a woman, a world-renowned marine biologist who was despairing at the reef dying, who in returning to the bay remembers how her mother had stirred in her this activism. And at the end of the film, we didn't want to propose a solution, which is why I love your question. Like We couldn't at the end say the solution is. Um, because I think that would be na naive of us. But what we could say is that this incredible scientist now believes she can, she can she's, she's been galvanized by the memory of her mother. Um, there are practical things in there, like um, the marine reserves that have been established, which are definitely having such a massive impact right around Australia on regenerating these marine environments. Um, but yeah, no, thank you. That's a, that's, that, that really is ultimately, I think, what I'd hope, that it's a story from pessimism to optimism through the memory of what her mother taught her and this fish. Yeah. Thank you for giving us that today. Congratulate these people on a wonderful film. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming with the film. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. You can go.